ஹலோ ஃப்ரெண்ட்ஸ் வெல்கம் டு சங்கர் ஐஏஎஸ் அகாடமி டெய்லி நியூஸ் பேப்பர் அனாலிசிஸ் டுடேஸ் டேட் இஸ் ஒன் ஃபோர் டூ தௌசண்ட் டுவெண்ட்டி ஃபோர் ஃப்ரம் டுடே வி வில் பி ஆல்சோ டிஸ்கஸிங் ப்ரீவியஸ் இயர் கொஸ்டின்ஸ் அலாங் வித் டெய்லி நியூஸ் பேப்பர் அனாலிசிஸ் பிஹைண்ட் மீ ஆர் த லிஸ்ட் ஆஃப் ஆர்டிகல்ஸ் தட் வி ஆர் அபவுட் டு டிஸ்கஸ் டுடே ஸோ வித்வுட் மஸ்ட் டிலே லெட்ஸ் கெட் ஸ்டார்ட் லெட் அஸ் ஸ்டார்ட் அவர் டிஸ்கஷன் வித் த ப்ரீவியஸ் இயர் கொஸ்டின் அனாலிசிஸ் லுக் அட் திஸ் டுவெண்ட்டி டுவெண்ட்டி த்ரீ பிலிம்ஸ் கொஸ்டின் இட் கம்ஸ் அண்டர் த சிலபஸ் ஆஃப் ஜியோகிரஃபி ஸோ த கொஸ்டின் இஸ் கன்சிடர் த ஃபாலோயிங் பேர் காமராஜர் போர்ட் ஃபர்ஸ்ட் மேஜர் போர்ட் இன் இந்தியா ரெஜிஸ்டர்ட் ஆஸ் அ கம்பெனி முத்ரா போர்ட் லார்ஜஸ்ட் பிரைவேட்லி ஓன்ட் போர்ட் இன் இந்தியா விசாகப்பட்டினம் போர்ட் லார்ஜஸ்ட் கண்டெய்னர் போர்ட் இன் இந்தியா ஹவு மெனி பேர்ஸ் கிவன் அபவ் ஆர் கரெக்ட் த ஆப்ஷன்ஸ் ஆர் ஒன்லி ஒன் பேர் ஒன்லி டூ பேர் ஆல் த த்ரீ பேர் நன் ஆஃப் த அபவ் பேர் த கரெக்ட் ஆன்சர் இஸ் ஆப்ஷன் பி ஒன்லி டூ பேர் Let's now discuss the answer key. Pair 1 is correct because Komarajar Port located in the Coromandel Coast about 24 km north of Chennai Port is the 12th major port of India and the first port in India which is a public company and it is also the only corporatized major port in India. Pair 2 is also correct. Mudra Port is the largest private port in India. The port of Mudra is located on the north shores of Gulf of Kutch near Mudra. Kutch district in the state of Gujarat. Mudra is the major hub for the containers and bulk cargo. It is run by Adani Ports and SE is at limited and begin operations in 2001. Pair 3 is incorrect because Jawaharlal Nehru Port Trust, Navaseva is the largest container port in India and is one of the most essential subcontinent harbors on the western coast. In this context, let us learn some important facts about ports in India. See, ports in India are classified as major and minor ports according to jurisdictions of central and state government as defined under India Port Trust Act 1908. Major ports are owned and managed by central government and minor ports are owned and managed by the state government. Major ports are under the union list of Indian constitution and are administered under the Indian Ports Act 1908 and Major Port Trust Act 1963 each major port is governed by the board of trustee appointed by the government of india the trust operate on the basis of policy directives and the orders from government of india their functions include planning management and operations of port the tariffs for the major port are fixed by the tariff authority for major ports know that india has 13 major ports and 200 plus non major ports or intermediate ports now let us learn about transshipment ports which is certainly more important for 2024 prelims transshipment is when the containers are sent to a middle point before being loaded onto other ships that take them to the final destination this process helps change the type of transport used in delivering the goods and can group together smaller shipment or break down larger ones depending on the need so why india need this let's see there are several reasons to it while the west coast of india has direct service gateway ports that can send cargo straight to its destination without needing transshipment whereas the east coast relies more on transshipment facilities currently india doesn't have a well equipped transshipment ports which means it has to use the ports in other countries like sri lanka colombo port singapore Malaysia, Oman and UAE for this purpose. This reliance is quite significant. About 25% of India's container cargo has to be sent to the overseas port with Colombo alone handling around 11%. Using the foreign ports for transshipment makes it more expensive and less competitive for India's business. So now there are three transshipment ports in India quickly taking ship. We will see them one by one. Washington International Seaport, Kerala. It is strategically located near the international shipping route and it is set to become India's premier deep water transshipment port with a natural draft of over 18 meters, potentially extending up to 20 meters. Galatia Bay Port, Great Nicobar Island, with an ambitious plan to handle 16 million containers per year at its ultimate stage by 2058. The Galatia Bay Port represents a critical development in India's efforts to establish a significant transshipment presence. Vallarpadam, Cochin, Kerala aims to transform into a competitive international transshipment hub. It is situated strategically on the southwestern coast of India. That's all about this discussion. Let's move on to another prelims question. Look at this another question from 2023 prelims. Consider the following statement. Jhelum River passes through Volgar Lake. Krishna River directly feeds Kolera Lake. Meandering of Gandak River formed Kanwar Lake. How many of the statements given above are correct? Only one, only two, all the three, none. See this question is testing your knowledge on rivers and the lakes formed by them all the rivers were frequently in the news so answering them should not be a difficult task for you now let's decode this question first statement says jhelum river passes through volgar lake this statement is correct volgar lake is the largest freshwater lake in india located in the state of jammu and kashmir it is located at the northern end of the valley of kashmir 
about 32 km northwest of Srinagar. The lake covers an area of 189 square kilometers during the monsoon season, but it can shrink as small as to 30 square km during the dry season. The Jhelum River flows through the lake and the lake controls the flow of the river. So the statement 1 is absolutely correct. Second statement says Krishna River directly feeds Kolir Lake. Is it so? Not really. Krishna River does not directly feed Kolir Lake. Kolir Lake is located in the state of Andhra Pradesh. It is located between Krishna and Godavari Ridla, about 15 kilometers away from the city of Eluru and 65 kilometers from Raja Mahendravaram. The river is fed by water from Budameru and Tamileru streams, which are seasonal streams. The lake covers an area of 245 square kilometer during the monsoon season but it can shrink to as small as 100 square kilometer during the dry season. So therefore, Krishna river does not directly feed Kolir lake. Hence, statement 2 is incorrect. Third statement says that meandering of Gantak river formed Kanwar lake. See, Kanwar lake is also known as Kabartal. It is the largest freshwater lake in the state of Bihar. It is located 22 kilometers northwest of the town of Begusarai. Kanwar Lake is actually an Oxbow Lake. Oxbow Lake is a type of lake that is formed when a river changes course and leaves behind a curved section of its old channel. Kanwar Lake was formed by the meandering of Gandhak River, a tributary of Ganges River in the geological past. It is a shallow lake with a maximum depth of 3 meters. The lake is fed by Gandhak River and by rainwater. So the statement 3 is obviously a correct answer. So the correct answer for this question is option B, only 2. With this, let's get into the today's newspaper discussion. Look at this article. This news article talks about the sudden spike in the demand for precious metal. Specifically, the article is talking about gold and silver markets. So in this news article discussion, let us learn about gold from Prelim's perspective. Gold in its purest form is bright, slightly reddish yellow, dense, soft, malleable and ductile metal. It is one of the least reactive chemical elements and is solid under standard condition. Gold often occurs in free elemental form as nuggets or grains, in rocks, in veins and in alluvial deposits. Look at this image. This is how gold in vein looks like. One of the unique properties of gold is that it is resistant to corrosion and to most acids. Gold is relatively scarce metal in the world and a scarce commodity in India. By states, the largest resource in terms of gold ore are located in Bihar 44% followed by Rajasthan 25%, Karnataka 21% and West Bengal and Andhra Pradesh have each 3% and Jharkhand having 2%. The remaining 2% of resource are located in Chhattisgarh, Madhya Pradesh, Kerala, Maharashtra and Tamil Nadu. Although Bihar is the leading state in India as far as resource of gold ore are concerned. However, the resource estimate are at preliminary stage and falls under inferred and reconnaissance categories. In terms of metal content, Karnataka remained on the top followed by Rajasthan, Andhra Pradesh, Bihar and Jharkhand etc. Some of the significant gold mines are at Kolar Gold Mine located near Bengaluru and Hatti Gold Mine located in Raichur district of Karnataka. Ramagiri in Anandapur district. Some of the significant gold mines are the Kolar Gold Field located near Bengaluru and the Hatti Gold Mine located in the Raichur district of Karnataka. KGF was closed in 2001 and Hatti is currently one of the significant gold producers in India. Presently, gold is mainly sourced from Raichur district of Karnataka, Kurnal district of Andhra Pradesh and Singbam East in Jharkhand. Here, it is important to note that the domestic demand is mainly met through imports. Countries around the world with significant deposits include South Africa, Australia, Indonesia, Canada, Ghana, Chile, China, USA, Russia, etc. But Switzerland remains the largest source for gold imports for India with about 41% share. It is followed by UAE about 13% and South Africa about 10%. The precious metal accounts for over 5% of country's total imports. India is the world's second biggest gold consumer after China. That's all about this discussion. Let's move on to the next topic. Look at this news article. It talks about tropical cyclones which forms over warm ocean waters with temperature over 26.5 degrees Celsius, bringing strong winds, heavy rain and storm surges causing significant damage to coastal areas. Most tropical cyclones occur in North Atlantic, East Pacific, West Pacific, South Pacific and Indian Ocean, with the West Pacific being the most active region. The Sapphire-Simpson hurricane wind scale 
categorizes cyclones based on the wind speed with the category 5 being the most severe exceeding 252 km per hour but due to global warming recent research suggests the need for a category 6 classification due to the record breaking cyclone intensities with this backdrop let us understand about tropical cyclones let's begin with what are tropical cyclones the tropical cyclones are the violent storms that originate over oceans or seas in tropical areas the cyclones that formed in ocean seas will tend to move over the coastal areas while reaching the coastal areas it brings about a large scale destruction know that the tropical cyclones are known by different names in different ocean region see they are known as cyclones in the indian ocean and hurricanes in the atlantic then typhoons in the western pacific and south china sea and willy willies in the western australia the tropical cyclones originate and intensify over warm tropical oceans There are five major conditions that are favorable for the formation and intensification of tropical cyclones. I will list them one by one. Firstly, large sea surface with a temperature higher than 27 degrees Celsius. Secondly, presence of Coriolis force. Now, what is Coriolis force? See, Coriolis force is an apparent force caused by earth's rotation. To simply put, the rotation of the earth about its axis affects the direction of the wind. Here the force which is responsible for affecting the direction of wind is called Coriolis force. Note that It is a great impact on the direction of wind movement. That is why it is one of the major condition favorable for cyclone formation. That's all about the second condition. Now the third condition is small variation in the vertical wind speed in the ocean areas. Fourthly, a pre-existing weak low pressure area or a low cyclonic circulation and upper air divergence above the sea level. In this context, we have to understand that cyclone warning system that are being practiced today. C IMD or the Indian Meteorological Department uses color coded warning system to classify severity of tropical cyclones. The system uses four colors namely green, yellow, orange and red. Green color is used for the cyclones that are not expected to cause significant damage. The IMD uses green warning for the cyclones that are likely to cause a light to moderate rainfall and a wind speed up to 40 km per hour. Whereas yellow color is used for the cyclones that are expected to cause moderate damage. These are likely to cause heavy rainfall and wind speed of up to 40 to 60 km per hour. Orange color is used for the cyclones that are expected to cause substantial damage with extremely heavy rainfall and a wind speed of 60 to 100 km per hour. And finally, the red color is used for the cyclones that are expected to cause severe damage causing extremely high or heavy rainfall. and a wind speed of more than 100 km per hour the warning system is designed to help people prepare for the cyclone and to take appropriate action to protect themselves their families and their properties the color code is based on the forecasted wind speed rainfall and surge height the imd also issues forecast and updates on the progress of the storm and provides advice on what action to take in response to the storm that's all about this discussion with this let's move on to the next article This FAQ article from yesterday's newspaper is written in the backdrop of recently concluded symposium on the rights of indigenous people. This symposium was organized by University of Arizona on March 21, 2022. So in this news article discussion, let us learn about what is GBF and how it will impact India. First, we shall see about what is GBF. See, the Kuming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework that is GBF was adopted during the 15th Conference of Parties of United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity that is CBD its main purpose is to enable and accelerate the full implementation of the three objectives of CBD in a balanced manner so what are the three objectives of CBD let us see first one is conserving the biological diversity second one is sustainably using biological diversity and the third one is sharing the benefits of genetic resource fairly and equitably thereby the convention aims to halt and reverse biodiversity loss while also encouraging actions that will lead to sustainable future so to achieve these goals the framework provides four goals for 2050 and 23 targets for 2030 you can see them in the image given here you can go through it now let's see what are the concerns that are being raised with respect to gbf see the third target among the 23 goals is more concerning one The target 3 says that by 2030 the areas of particular importance for biodiversity and ecosystem functions and services should be increased at least 30% of the world's total terrestrial area. At present the protected areas cover only about 16%. This is particularly concerning to India because about 84% of India's national park were established in the areas inhabited by indigenous people. So the establishment of protected areas and a GBF may limit indigenous people access to natural resources within their traditional lands. 
they may even face pressure to vacate their lands to make the way for sustainable development activities undertaken by corporates often without adequate compensation or consent for example the initiative to upgrade the kumbalgar wildlife sanctuary in rajasthan to a tiger reserve will affect 162 tribal villages located inside and outside the sanctuary this is why the target 3 is more concerning now let's see how to address this issue firstly bringing amendments to the laws to make tribals as custodians of protected areas by acknowledging their role in conservation secondly equal distribution of protected areas and avoiding disproportionate targeting of tribal areas for conservation efforts finally human right violation within protected areas including access to education healthcare housing for indigenous people can be addressed that's all for this discussion with this let's move to the next article Look at this Indian Express article. It says that wheat stocks in government godown is at 9.7 million tons on March 1, which is lowest in the last 7 years. The author discusses how to improve this with Green Revolution 2.0 and suggests measures to work it out. This topic is very important for our mains. So let us learn this through our mains answer writing approach. First, let me read out the questions. Discuss why India needs Green Revolution 2.0 in the context of its agricultural development. Analyze challenges associated and the potential impact on the sustainable agriculture and food security. This topic comes under GS paper 3. Here the question demands three things. One, why India needs Green Revolution 2.0. Second, is the challenge associated. And the third one is the impact on agriculture and food security so let's break down this into three parts our introduction can go like this the first green revolution which occurred in 1960s and 1970s was pivotal in transforming india's agricultural landscape enhancing food security and reducing the dependence on food imports however the evolving demands of the present day call for a new wave of innovation and reforms this can be your sample introduction now moving on to the body part first let us write about the reasons why india needs another green revolution that is green revolution 2.0 declining soil fertility the intensive farming practice of the past decade has led to a significant soil degradation marked by nutrient depletion and decreased fertility reversing this trend is crucial for sustaining agricultural productivity note that indian soil has only 0.4 ppm of soil organic carbon as against the standard norm of 0.8 ppm declining water table Groundwater irrigation promoted water intensive crops which resulted in groundwater depletion. For example, paddy consumes 2 to 3 times more water than alternative crops like maize or pulses. Every kilogram of paddy produced in Punjab consumes about 800 to 1200 liters of water. Green revolution led to a loss of biodiversity and genetic diversity of crops as well as displacement of indigenous crops and traditional farming practices. For example, the production of wheat and rice doubled after the green revolution while that of the other crops like indigenous rice varieties and millets have decreased. Green revolution increased the vulnerability of crops to pest disease and climate change for example the monoculture of rice and wheat made them more susceptible to outbreaks of pest and disease such as brown plant hopper and wheat rust now moving on to the second part of the body that is the challenges we can write as follows environmental concerns the intensive farming practice of the previous green revolution has led to soil degradation reduced biodiversity and water scarcity a new revolution must focus on reversing these impacts through a sustainable practices climate changes with erratic weather patterns increased frequency of extreme weather events and the rising temperature agriculture is more vulnerable than ever before developing climate resistant crop varieties and farming practice is crucial socio economic issues small land holding farmers who constitute a significant portion of india's agricultural landscape often lack access to the resource technology and the markets needed to benefit from the advanced agricultural practices ensuring equity in the benefits of agricultural advancement is a major challenge technological and knowledge gaps there is a pressing need for innovation in sustainable farming techniques and their widespread adoption which requires overcoming the existing technological and knowledge barriers now moving on to the third part that is the potential impact on the sustainable agriculture and food security we can write as follows the green revolution 2.0 has the potential to transform indian agriculture into a more sustainable and a resilient sector by integrating advanced biotechnologies precision agriculture and climate smart practices it could enhance soil health reduce water use through efficient irrigation system and decrease resilience on the chemical inputs by adopting organic farming practice and biofertilizers a significant impact of this revolution would be the bolstering of india's food security by developing crop varieties that not only are high yielding but also resilient to climate change india can ensure a stable food supply even in the face of increasing climate uncertainties 
this would also help in stabilizing food prices thereby making food more accessible to the vulnerable section of the society moreover sustainable agriculture practice advocated by green revolution 2.0 could lead to regeneration of ecosystem practices such as crop rotation mixed cropping and the conservation agriculture can enhance biodiversity improve soil health and reduce greenhouse gas emission contributing to the overall health of the environment incorporating digital technologies for precision farming can empower farmers with real time informations on weather soil health market prices enabling them to make informed decision this can improve farm profitability while reducing wastage and environmental impact so this can be your third part now moving on to the conclusion the green revolution 2.0 offers a pathway to a sustainable agriculture and food security in india by addressing the limitation of the previous revolution and adapting to the current challenges of climate change and resource depletion its success will require coordinated efforts from government private sector and agriculture community to overcome the associated challenges and realize its full potential along with our today's newspaper discussion there are two more important articles from hindu newspaper today that we need to go through one is israel strike on hospital camp in gaza strip with respect to this article we have to focus on geographical aspect of israel gaza and golan hai and the rivers and seas surrounding it it is a potential area for this year's prelims and the next article will be the art of india's hiv response it is an editorial article today we have to focus on india's action plan that is national aids control program and 1990-90 plan and the inherent challenges therein and the drugs used in the treatment both of these article are crucial for prelims 2024 on mains perspective please go through it that's all about this discussion let's now move on to today's practice question discussion look at this question consider the following statement with reference to silver it exhibits highest electrical conductivity it reflects almost all wavelength in the visible spectrum the metal is found in earth's crust as alloy and not in the pure free elemental form which of the above statements is or correct one only one and two only two and three only one two three only the correct answer is option b silver exhibits highest electrical conductivity and thermal conductivity it also have high reflectivity reflecting almost all the wavelength in the visible spectrum region so the statements one and two are correct the metal is found in earth's crust in the pure form free elemental form as an alloy with gold and other metals and in minerals such as argentite chloragarite so the statement 3 is incorrect most silver is produced as a by product of copper gold lead and zinc refining by states the largest resource in terms of silver ore are located in rajasthan which accounts for about 87% jharkhand 5% andhra pradesh 4% and karnataka having 2% zawar mines in udaipur rajasthan is the largest silver producing mine in the country look at the second question consider the following statements with reference to cuming montreal global biodiversity framework under this framework countries agreed to protect 30% of land and water considered important for biodiversity by 2030 the framework has been made legally binding on the member countries due to the failure of ic targets it is also known as 30 by 30 initiative how many of the statements given above are correct one only two only all the three none of the above the correct answer is option b two only Statement 1 is correct. Even India has agreed to protect 30% of land and water considered important for biodiversity by 2030. Statement 2 is wrong. The agreement is not legally binding, but countries will be required to show their progress on meeting targets through the national biodiversity plans. Statement 3 is correct. The framework is also known as 30 by 30 initiative. Behind me is the today's mains practice question. If you are interested, please write it in the comment section below. If you like this video, please do share and subscribe. Thank you.